Hi folks, so today I am going to be doing a little bit of viewer feedback. Um, yeah, because you always know when a channel is dying when they start doing viewer feedback. It does seem to be something of a symptom, but uh, no. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, actually this channel is in a little bit of freefall when it comes to subscribers, and I think there's a few reasons for it. Partly because of the fact that I just upload as and when rather than on a regular schedule, and I don't think the free software games have have necessarily helped the subscriber numbers but again it's just all recalibration and it is what it is to be honest um, I have long since passed cared about the numbers on on the YouTube channel here um, you know Peertube is is looking really quite healthy I'm really enjoying working on my website and Gemini is is still kind of fun to be with as well as things like trendy talk and with trendy talk we don't really care uh, about any of the of the numbers other than just like people emailing in and um, and chatting with us it's a much more sort of like community centric kind of thing and I think that's one of the things I've come to learn over the years is that even though like subscribers are dropping and you know views are sort of fine I guess I don't know maybe I don't know I don't even know the view numbers actually uh, but the number of people who are getting in touch and having a chat about the things I'm talking about still remains very high very active and also like very sensible and intelligent and civil I'd like to uh, thank everyone who watches the, this video that I know that yesterday's video was perhaps a little bit of a, a you know an issue where many folks might disagree with me on but I really do respect the fact that every single one of you was uh, polite, kind, intelligent and courteous about it all. And I think that's really good in general because it, it, it allows me to feel pretty safe talking about issues that you guys may not see eye to eye with me on. Um, and then we get to like work it out. Uh, I'm never above, you know, changing my thoughts on a process. I've changed my mind on many subjects throughout the course of this channel. And I will no doubt continue to do so. I try and be as informed as possible. Uh, but I also allow uh, myself a degree of flexibility and I allow uh, myself a degree of forgiveness when I get things wrong. Um, yeah, I, I'm by no means the most technically literate person in the community. I'm far from it, actually. In fact, I probably feel that I represent uh, the sort of the segment of the community that is not particularly technically, a, 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 you know, expert. We are not necessarily, you know, but, but rather uh, passionate about the the ethos of the free software movement and the politics of the free software movement uh, and the philosophy of the free software movement rather than um, the actual technical ramifications of it uh, myself. When it comes to things like System D, for example, I don't have a strong opinion on System D because all things considered, I do understand the broad principles and the broad disagreements of it, but at the end of the day, if my open source Libra operating system works well and works the way that I want it to, I'm by and large really quite happy. I will allow, or well, no, I will allow. I will accept the um, the the arguments and the um, and the discussions of the more expert people to deal out, you know, to deal with the more expert issues, and um, and and allow progress to be made because I think that the Linux desktop is in an absolutely wonderful place right now. Uh, at home, I'm still using the, uh, Linux Mint Debian edition. And it's the lowest maintenance system I've ever had. It's fantastic. Um, and yes, the packages are a little bit older. Sometimes I'll bring in a flat pack. Sometimes I'll bring in an app image. And it, it does, uh, you know, fill that, that, that gap of an older package. I think a Debian-based operating system, a Debian-stable-based operating system, like now's the time for it. Because uh, especially a lot of people, um, you know, don't necessarily care about the latest and greatest packages. Um, and, and those that do can run Arch. You know, it's a win-win for everyone, right? Um, some people have mentioned, I think Brody mentioned on his channel, that there is something of a Linux distribution problem where there are too many Linux distributions. Um, I, I don't know, maybe I'll weigh in on that issue as well. I think that in many cases it can be. Uh, you know, you've got Debian that has a good corner of the market, which is slow and steady. You've got Arch, which has got its corner of the market, which is much more up to date and uh, and flexible. Um, and then, you know, you've got some of the like the, the Ubuntu's and the Fedora's, which kind of fit somewhere in the middle, but they're largely corporate distributions for corporate purposes. Um, and I think with Linux Mint, wh whereas they are often more to do with the community than the technical things. Yes, they've got some technical tools that they bring in that make things easier for the end user. But I think the thing that Linux Mint brings, rather than uh, technical differences to other distributions, is the fact that they take something that's Ubuntu-based, which would usually be made for corporate use, and then uh, provide a more, um, uh, you know, sort of human-centric, human-centric, people-centric, more grassroots kind of community around it. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, kind of uh, very worthwhile as well. Um, 
But yeah, maybe there, you know, I think that there, there's something to be said there. Maybe I'll give that some thought. But today I just want to address a few comments that I've had uh, in uh, response to, well, just in general stuff uh, earlier on. I've actually had a surprising number of correspondents asking about a Trendy Talk podcast RSS. So I'm going to spill the beans on podcasts in general. I've been on more than a few podcasts and the overwhelming majority of the ones that I've been in charge, almost Every single podcast I have been in charge of has closed. Uh, sometimes it's closed in the event, uh, in, in the um, example of, uh, of the April cast, it ended because April ended. Um, there were, uh, I, I did consider uh, moving it continue, you know, moving it onwards from April, but at the end of the day, I didn't necessarily have the time and I felt that with a lot of the subjects I talk about, I'd end up repeating myself. So I may come back and do like another type of April casting that is available exclusively on Gemini, I think it is. I think Hex's radio station also hosts um, the April cast as well. So I may very well do like a, a, a similar type of thing later on in the year, um, if the, you know, with new subjects and that kind of stuff. But yeah, every single uh, podcast that I've been on, uh, except it has, has basically closed, right? Um, or has been handed off to someone else or, or whatever. Because the, here's the thing about podcasts, they are so much more work than you think that they are, right? You think the podcast is just a bunch of people sitting down in front of a microphone or a couple of microphones and just having a chat. It is not, right? Every single podcast... Uh, I remember when I was doing Gamesphere. I really kind of enjoyed, particularly the beginnings of Gamesphere. And then it ended up getting to the part where I, I was playing games explicitly for the podcast and then it ceased to become a fun little hobby then and it became like a job. And I've already got a job. And I didn't want to have all the fun of games being sucked out for the for the sake of, of games fear, especially trying to fit it into a busy uh, schedule. Uh, there was also the Technical Warehouse, again, which was also a low fidelity podcast. But again, scheduling times uh, was very, very difficult in that regard. Uh, podcast Chronicle, which technically actually hasn't retired. We just haven't made an episode for like a year. Um, yeah, we haven't made an episode in like a year because scheduling is, again, it's very difficult. So, uh, you know, when it comes to things like you have to balance scheduling, you have to balance it with your time, uh, you have to balance it with subject matter as well. And generally speaking, the lower the fidelity, the more likely the podcast is, is to survive. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, for example, in Trading Talk, we don't have fixed schedules, uh, because we know that if we have a fixed schedule, the moment, like once we'd missed like two episodes, uh, we, it would end up being like, we might, you know, it, it, we, you'd get that feeling that the podcast was like failing at that point. So... Uh, when it comes to, uh, to to things like Trendy Talk, we, we keep it loose. We keep it friendly. We try very much to present the podcast as it is made. And by and large, that is exactly what you get. You get a truly authentic experience. If it's terrible, it's terrible. If it's good, it's good. The only uh, sort of behind the scenes of Trendy Talk that we have is that we have a little Discord room, uh, just me, Hex, Andrew, no one else, and we discuss things that are like, oh, is this worth bringing up on the, on the podcast? Not bringing up? And that's literally about it. Uh, sometimes we post like some funny gifts that we found on the internet as well. And that's really it. That's, that's the behind the scenes. There's going to be no making of doc documentary of Trendy Talk. That's literally it. Um, you know, it's not, not even any uh, non-disclosure agreements. I've completely blown the doors open on Trendy Talk. Um, so that leads me to the, the, the correspondence uh, that several of you have, have sent across. So don't Please don't feel like I'm singling anyone out. I've had quite a few correspondence about this, um, certainly over the weeks, but even just over the past uh, 24 hours, why there is not a, an RSS podcast feed of Trendy Talk. And it is because it would end up being work. It would end up being, I don't want to even say too much work because I don't really want it to be work at all. Um, we do not get paid. We do not get a penny for Trendy Talk, nor do we want one. Um, there was a moment where um, we were, or I was approached um, by a particular company that I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, for a very sort of uh, a tacit sponsorship. Nothing lucrative, but something that um, would require us to like say a brand name uh, on the air. And that was like struck down immediately. Um, so, you know, like any kind of, of, of uh, sponsorship is really pretty about as off the cards as it's going to be. Because then, of course, it, it is kind of self-censorship. Any kind of podcast with a sponsor is going to have a degree of, of censorship. Um, and I, by, all, by all accounts, like, we all have lives outside of Trendy Talk, so we all are going to, like, you know, take that into consideration as well. And, uh, and, and and we are going to be presentable to, to a degree. Hex puts on a shirt. Um, 
Drew covered up the horrible stains on his wall. You know, all, all of that kind of stuff. But like, yeah, at the end of the day, there is, you know. But anyway, uh, I'm getting off track. The reason we don't have an RSS feed, yeah, for, for audio podcasts particularly, is, is simply because it would involve actually hosting it again in a fourth place. Right? It's already hosted on four, uh, three places. It's hosted on YouTube, it's hosted on Peertube, and it's hosted on Gemini. Uh, if you want the audio version, you can subscribe to it on Gemini. It's available on a Gemini feed, but you do need like a Gemini uh, browser client. Uh, like Lagrange, for example, I think Amphora also does uh, subscriptions. You subscribe to the feed and that's how you access it. Or you could just pop into the Trinity Talk website and, um, and, and click on it. It's uh, gem.chrisware.uk slash Trendy Talk. And that is, of course, on Gemini. Um, so yeah, it would involve hosting it in a fourth place. Now, Peertube's kind of good because Peertube can just mirror the, the Trendy Talk that goes up on Hex's YouTube channel. And then I do a little bit of work on the audio for the Gemini. So the audio on the Gemini is slightly better balanced. I'm not going to say it's better quality because it is sourced from, from Hex's recording side. But um, it is like compressed a little bit, so the, the audio levels are a little bit more balanced, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that I'm told by like people who know a bit more about podcasts than I do, that uh, if it's audio only, uh, you do want to balance the levels a little bit, like uh, pay a little bit more attention to balancing levels because that's kind of, uh, when you're watching it, you're often watching it like on a phone or loud. Anyway, I don't, I don't know the technical ins and outs of it, but apparently if it's audio only, you, you, you know, you want to f- balance out the levels as best you can because that's, that's kind of, all, you know, that's, everything that you're offering the uh, the end user, the viewer, the listener. Um, so yeah, that fundamentally is it. We'd have to find a fourth place of hosting. There's a likelihood that we'd have to end up paying for it. We could do some sort of, um, you know, use some of the same bandwidth or use some of the same stuff that it is hosted on Gemini. And maybe that's not out of the question, but then we'd have to code the feed. Um, and yeah, again, yeah, it's work. And the more work it becomes, the more of a chore it becomes, the more of a chore it becomes, the less likely we'll be able to do it, shall we say, after a day at work or uh, first thing on a Sunday morning or something like that. Um, so the idea behind Trendy Talk is that it's, you know, uh, less of a chore. If some of you good folks do want to actually just like upload it to somewhere where, where you know, like... Um, Funk Whale or something like that. Uh, the you know we do release Trendy Talk under a Creative Commons attribution required share alike license. So we're not going to stop you if you do if, if anyone decides to do that. However, that has that kind of thing has happened before with other content that I've made, and almost always every actually every single time without exception, uh, the person who's been like mirroring content to another platform has ended up getting bored and sodding off basically. So. The short answer is like I really you know like I, I understand that many of you folks would enjoy listening to uh, trendy talk through a more traditional um, podcast reader, but hey, if if the Joe Rogan experience can go uh, can go like Spotify exclusive, we can go PeerTube and Gemini exclusive slash bit on YouTube. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. Um, it is, you know, you can, it, it is laziness, it is whatever it is, but like, yeah, it's, you know, it's not a high fidelity podcast, it's designed to be truly authentic, and, you know, we're not going to sell merch or anything like that, you know, we had that, that long running joke on, on, on with Drew, that like, yeah, if you, if you want anything, cl- the closest thing to merch on Trendy Talk, just like get a t-shirt and make some holes in it, and that's like, you know, because a good guy like Drew wears a, you know, shaggy t-shirt kind of thing, um, yeah, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. Um, or like get a t-shirt and just write trendy talk on it or draw a picture of a fish. Wear something with a fish on it. Actually, oh, we know we did that with um, Podcast Chronicle as well, where it's like, I can't remember what it was, but like we don't have merch, just wear something with a, with a animal on it or something like that. Uh, that. That was like our idea of merch. Like if you want to be in, in the club, if you want to be part of the the you know, whatever collective fan term that you're going to use, fam or, uh, what's, uh, what's PewDiePie's one? Bro fist, you know, oh, I'm not down with the kids, am I? Uh, okay, anyway, so yeah, uh, that's it. And the other thing that I want to, uh, to end on is simply, uh, I have, uh, had a good chat with a few of you folks, good, good banter when it comes to, uh, to yesterday's video. And, um, I kind of just want to clear where I'm coming from up. 
um, because I don't feel like I made the distinction between approaching the problem of, of privacy and big tech as an individual versus uh, approaching it as a society. I, myself, and how I live my life, I live very openly. I have a YouTube channel and I use my real name on that YouTube channel. I am a very open person. Uh, I am also a very privileged person as well. Um, you know, I live in a country where I, I feel like I can speak very freely and very openly. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, uh, yeah, it is a privilege. You know, I am not, for example, um, you know, an oppressed minority in a country that is very violent towards oppressed minorities. So, you know, who, who may very well value privacy or very well may require privacy, discretion and anonymity a lot more than that. It's a position of privilege and it's an individual decision that I've made based on that. Um, I'm not even, you know, I'm not like even trying to clear my conscience and I'm not necessarily trying to justify it. I'm really just trying to explain it. No one person, myself or any of you folks, are going to be a pure moral character. We make our decisions day to day and convenience comes into that. Uh, it comes into our decisions uh, in terms of the food we buy at the supermarket, in terms of the electronics we buy uh, that we use in our day to day life, the tools we use at work. We make these decisions every single day. And um, as individuals, no, not one of us or very few of us are going to have the means for systemic change. There are a few people throughout history who, who may very well have had massive influence. Uh, for people like Aaron Schwartz, for example, come immediately to mind. That kid was an absolute genius and what happened to him um, under US law enforcement was an absolute disgrace. Also people like Edward Snowden as well. These are people that can make big um, you know, tidal shifts in, in, in people's attitudes, but people of course already know um, that they're being surveilled by big tech and they still choose to act the way that they do. So as an individual, yeah, I could absolutely act uh, uh, with complete anonymity. My computer, I could use the Tails operating system and I could wipe my hard drive every single time I log out. Uh, and I would be absolutely anonymous and absolutely private, but I'd also be substantially more cut off from society than most other people. Um, and, uh, and as an individual, that only hurts me and does not benefit wider society. Uh, when it comes to uh, collective change, we need to act as a whole, as a group. And I think that this involves winning or fighting and winning the battles that are sensible to win, right? One of the things that over the years has really kind of hit me right in the heart when it comes to the fight for FOSS software is when people watch me floundering over the open source alternatives to Google Maps. You cannot beat Google Maps. Not even Apple can beat Google Maps. Google Maps is an incredibly useful tool that is uh, that, that a lot of people use and I think Andrew Yang said it and you know when he talks about open source software um, you know and it's probably when it comes to like presidential candidates and and and, and uh, politicians in general probably one of the people that is most clued up on, on this kind of thing but even he has the uh, that sort of uh, open source corporate approach slash perspective to it vis-a-vis -vis his background um, but he said, no one wants to use the second best GPS service. Do you want to use the second best GPS service? No one wants to use the second best GPS service. When you're like lost in some, you know, single track road in the middle of the countryside and you don't know where to go, you're going to install Google Maps. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. Everyone does it. And that sucks. But... Uh, I didn't mean to imply that I was giving up the fight on FOSS. Absolutely not, right? There are many situations where we can meaningfully win, right? We're not necessarily looking for a complete overhaul overnight, but it's a matter of like just picking our battles and, 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 and winning the ones where we can. I think Mastodon and Plerima and the, uh, the entire Fediverse that's a really strong battleground where we have a really strong showing in. Um, some of the minds that have, have gone into developing the community that's there have incredibly, like when it comes to uh, political talent are incredibly intelligent as well as technically literate as well. Um, and it really is quite good. Like the Fediverse is somewhere where someone without much of a technical background can find a home. I, you know, I know a bit about technology. I run my own Gemini server, for example, 
one of the reasons I like Gemini is because someone of my level of technical expertise, maybe moderate, in the middle somewhere, right, can, can get it up and running. I can use PeerTube very easily. Things like PeerTube, things like Mastodon, things like Plarima, they allow us to collectively join together, form communities and pool our resources, and that is an example of where we can be very strong. Yes, many of them are going to run on Amazon services, but you know what? There are many Plarima instances that run on a Raspberry Pi on someone's home. You know, it allows us to be flexible. It allows us to be mobile. Um, and that is definitely very beneficial. I don't even need to mention the Linux kernel itself. Yes, there is some uh, very complex politics when it comes to allowing Google and Microsoft and Intel and Samsung to contribute to that, uh, that kernel. But fundamentally speaking, the actual core principles uh, of open code and all of that kind of stuff, they stay true. And, and, and we see that in, for example, the Debian version of the kernel. Um, you know, so, so that, you know, the kernel is undeniably a massive strength of, uh, of, of open source software. I know it's a bit trite to say. I often, of course, use uh, free and open source gaming as a bit of an analog because it's a very visual analog, very easy to get. It would be ridiculous for a free and open source gaming project to try and make the next Call of Duty, to try and make the next Fortnite or something like that. You know, a AAA game, high fidelity, really, you know, kind of great to, you know, bring in the games. Let's not even forget that a lot of these AAA gaming studios, they spend untold amounts of money on marketing. We do not, of course, have untold amounts of money uh, to, to spend on marketing. Would we put 100 million US dollars into marketing, uh, you know, LibreOffice or Caden Live? or even something like Blender. Uh, you know, Blend Blender's great because it is a tool and people are often on the lookout for like great, you know, tools and things like that. But when it comes to a lot of things that require a degree of marketing, that's why big tech wins, it's, it's the marketing. They, they they don't just spend hundreds of millions of, of, of dollars, if not billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars at this stage on marketing when it comes to, you know, by accident. They just don't. There's a reason when a Hollywood film is made that the amount of money spent on producing the film is then also used on promoting the film. You know, that's, that's the thing. When I put out a video here on YouTube, I do not put a penny into promoting that video. I'm sure some YouTubers do as a matter of course. You know, I do not. All of this is completely organic growth. Then again, though, I don't actually put a single penny into producing them if you don't count like the electricity in the phones or, or something like that. So maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm matching them proportionally in regards to Hollywood movies. But, um, but at the end of the day, you don't see me trying to make the next Avengers and uh, you don't see free and open source game developers trying to make the next like Call of Duty. Uh, the best free and open source games are the ones that lean into the strengths of their community. The battle for West North and its, its modern community. Same thing with the uh, even Super Tux Cart and, and the fact that it's cute and fun and like it's just a nod and a wink to the Linux mascots. There's a bit of fun there, a bit of inside jokes. It's not meant to seriously compete with, um, with Mario Kart. Um, and again, I think it's fair to say that Super Touch Kart might not necessarily be the best of what free and open source games have to offer. It is a bit of a meme, um, but it's fun. I, you know, when I played uh, Super Touch Kart with the, the Linux Destination group, it was fun. I had fun. That's what a game's supposed to do. Um, I think one of the best free and open source games is, of course, is Shapes. It's a simple game with simple mechanics and a simple graphic design, and that, that works a treat. Um, but yes, it's a matter of like knowing where your strengths are, playing to them, and fighting smarter and not harder. But it does come to the fact that our individual choices that we make, they're only that. They're individual choices. They're inconsequential in the larger scheme of things. If we don't have bigger um, systemic plans in motion, and it's as simple as that, um, it's all well and good being like you know private in and of yourself. And if you benefit from that personally, then you have made the right individual choice. Um, but most people at most times are not going to benefit from having um, is it Graphene OS or Lineage OS on on their phone. Um, in a, in a personal, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, capacity. And also, I think, you know, when we talk, you know, there was on the, um, on the news today, but we're talking about the Pegasus uh, malware that, go, that has been installed on many, many people's phones that is fundamentally uh, exploits zero-day 
uh, vulnerabilities, uh, you know, malware then gets installed onto, onto the phone through those zero day vulnerabilities, and then you've lost all privacy there and then anyway as a result of that. Um, with phones in particular, it to me, you know, you are carrying a GPS, a microphone and a camera around in your pocket. At that point, the battle I feel for privacy is lost because all it takes is zero day vulnerability and you're fucked. That's it. It doesn't matter if everyone plays by the rules and everyone works to their best intentions. There will be a human error somewhere along the, somewhere along the, uh, the production line and that can sink the entire ship. That's kind of the problem. Uh, that's why we can't rely on legislation and we can't rely on people's technical expertise because all it takes that's how alan turin of course cracked the uh the, the, the code because there, there was they they waited for someone to um there was like a the fail to switch the encryption discs or whatever it is i forget the uh, the technical term for it now but it was it was a couple of soldiers that were or a couple of you know spies or whatever at the end of the day and they decided not to change the code wheel and then bang you got two messages on the same code wheel and then it was cracked. All it takes is a little bit of human error. Sorry, I feel like I'm glossing over that a little bit well, but I'm, you know, just trying to run, tr trying to, trying to run with the idea that like, it's, it's you know, hum like there is always going to be a degree of human error, which means that if your systems aren't completely ironclad, which means you, you know, then, then it's only a matter of time before someone somewhere along the line trips up. The one message gets, you know, um, in, uh, doesn't get encrypted properly, or, you know, someone, seize your password or something like that like no system is 100 percent secure which means that if it is on the internet you do you never have 100 percent privacy and um and again i don't want to say all is lost right we do pick the battles and we do have to fight what we can and it's not simple right it, it's not simple i know that i'm waffling and wavering and coming at it from all different kind of angles here but that's kind of i guess how the world works um uh, we do what we can, but I don't ever think that we should ever rely on, on the web for, for any you know, serious, meaningful privacy, right? Yeah, obviously, we all have some details that we want to remain private. My bank details being sort of top of that list, right? No one wants to dox themselves or anything like that. Um, but I, quite frankly, you know, you look at the, I look at the risk assessment and I look at who I give my bank details to and I make the... the you know, cost risk analysis at the time. Every decision we make, we all do. So, um, you know, and then the cost benefit analysis as well. So, you know, we weigh up the risks and, and, and we do what we can. Um, but I think what's really important is, is systemic change. Um, if the options for things like privacy and security are not available to, to lay people, to, to just your bloke or lady or uh, person on the street, then... I don't see them as being wholly useful or I only see them as being, you know, part of the, uh, of the fundamental picture. Uh, and I'm much more interested in uh, developing, uh, you know, routes for privacy and security for people that are a lot more vulnerable than myself than myself. Um, you know, for at least the foreseeable future, uh, I cannot envision such a, such a scenario where I would benefit from cutting myself off from a lot of the incredibly useful services that are currently available to me through particularly Google. I'm singling out Google here because Google is the, is the big one there. Um, I, I, and I do make value of Google services. A company like Facebook, I do not see Facebook as a company with value. I do see Google as a company with value. YouTube offers tremendous value. I would not be speaking to you here today if it wasn't for YouTube. They provided me with that step on the content creation ladder. Um, and yeah, like I use Google services. I pay for Google services. I pay for Google Drive. Google Drive is useful. It is. It is. It's incredibly useful. Um, and like I say, I, yeah, I did use Dropbox. Dropbox is also a big tech solution. Um, and I wanted to use something that wasn't Google, but, but Dropbox, yeah, it just corrupted my files. Anyway, so, but like I say, the difference between individual privacy and the access to privacy for everyone is, is, is a particular distinction. And I, and I want to make that there. There are some things like in, in the tech world that I enjoy being part of the techie club involved with, Gemini being that. Um, I, you know, I understand that you, you, your person on the street your, your non-technical user isn't going to care about Gemini, isn't going to go out their way to use Gemini, isn't going to understand the benefits of Gemini. I know technical users that do not understand the benefits of Gemini. You know what, that's fine, because Gemini is a, a community in and of itself. 
People are welcome to join. People are welcome to stay where they are. Everything's good. So there we go. There's some things that I, I did want to, uh, to clear up. Um, when it comes to like alternative OSs for phones, I absolutely want to see them de develop. I want to see them thrive. It is absolutely a market there. But like I say, I'm not a big earner. I cannot afford um, to, to brick this phone. It would just make my work life tragically uh, difficult. Um, maybe one day I will pick up a second phone um, and, and have a, a, a play around with it. But um, a lot of people are saying that they don't consider their, their portable devices to be serious devices. They consider them to be like multimedia play devices. Um, for me, I consider my, my phone to be a work device. I, 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 it is just useful in that regard. But as such, do not consider it a private device. So at the end of my workday, that goes in this phone that I'm recording on, it goes into a drawer and I'll forget about it. And uh, so as such with the social media platforms that, uh, that this phone is connected to. Uh, and I feel that that's a healthy enough relationship with it, uh, that this phone does not follow me around everywhere I go. And, uh, and, and that's how, how I have, you know, that's how I, I, I work it through. Um, anyway, this video has gone on for long enough, but it's nice to have a, a good old chat with you folks. And uh, again, thank you very much for being like intelligent and civil and understanding in the comments section, in the correspondence that you've sent over to me. Uh, every single person has been um, has, has, has been wonderful. I've had zero, um, zero assholes, really, which is, which is great, which is great. So thank you very much for that. I do appreciate the kindness and thoughtfulness and intelligence that you good folks uh, have. So I'm going to leave you there, but thank you very much for joining me. It's a pleasure as always. And um, yeah, until next time, I've been Chris Ware and you've been awesome. Toodaloo.